Well, good morning and welcome to worship. This morning, God calls us to worship with the delight of his heart toward us, to know that we are called and blessed to be together. The center of God's worship, of course, our worship is the fact that God has accomplished something for us, something truly eternal changing, and that is he sent his son Jesus to die at the cross for our sins. And so with the psalmist, we sing these words, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God's His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. I invite you to stand for God's greeting this morning. From the one whose unfailing love endures forever, receive God's welcome and blessing this morning. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, from Jesus Christ, the Son, and from the Holy Spirit whose presence is here in this place and gives us rest and peace. And together, God's people say, Amen. Please join me in prayer together this morning. God of covenant, uh, you are ever faithful. As we gather here this morning, may we worship you in, in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts and lips to declare your faithfulness as we, as we sing your praise, as we hear your word, as we, as we receive the bread and cup with true repentance and faith. Then, O oh God, guide us in your paths of righteousness that we may, we may a witness to your grace and your wonderful salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's worship our faithful God as we sing some songs together, beginning with, I lift your name. <laughs> 
seated. The testimony of the Christian church has always been that by God's grace, we stand in awe of this grace. We stand in awe of the God who keeps his promises. And for centuries, the Christian church has professed this profound truth in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to recite those words together at this time as our, our public commitment and our, our public profession of faith. Once again, join me as we say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. People of God, we, we celebrate God's faithfulness this morning, which is uh, everlasting. His mercies are new every morning, and we do that as well as we spend some time in prayer, approaching the God who says, you may seek me and find me uh, when you seek me with all your heart. A couple prayer requests uh, to make you aware of. Uh, for those of you who receive emails, uh, you know about this already. Uh, Barb Niebuhr had her surgery uh, this past week. And uh, the surgery went well. The, the surgeon was very pleased with the uh, process itself. And so far, her recovery is also going well. She'll remain at Borg Borges Hospital for a couple more days uh, for initial healing. And then, Lord willing, we'll be able to come home soon. We want to continue to pray for uh, Bill Coburn and Bill and Kathy Coburn as Bill's mother, Nancy. Uh, she's 100 years old and was placed on hospice care this past week. Via email and our phone line, uh, we sent a prayer request out on behalf of Jordan and Michelle Veenstra. Michelle is the granddaughter of Jean Vader. They've been worshiping with us for uh, quite a bit the last year. Uh, Jordan's father had stem cell transplant surgery uh, this past Tuesday in Ann Arbor. So let's lift up Eric, Eric Veenstra, continue to pray for him. Uh, Rick Lingbeek is recovering well and uh, was going to be here this morning, but maybe didn't make it. That's all right. He did have recent big surgery as well, but uh, let's continue to pray for Rick and uh, Carol Bonsalar and others. And let's, let's go to God in prayer. Let's do that together. Our Father in heaven, as we've done already this morning, we've worshipped you. We've come before the God in whom we stand in awe, and all holy praise is due your name. We worship you, O God, because, again, uh, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We worship you, God, for the peace that surpasses understanding and meets us. It meets us here this morning. It meets us in times of calm and in times of crisis. We glorify you. For you are the refuge that we need, and you give strength to those who are weary and worn out. Father, with the psalmist, we say how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in harmony. We're not naive. We realize until Jesus returns that Satan's going to continue his assault on our friendships and our marriage, our families and our churches in where we work and where we play. So God, help us to resist him tenaciously. Help us to constantly marinate ourselves in the gospel and to abide in your love which is now and forevermore. Guide us, Holy Spirit, to be a people of peace in these days. Help us also to be attentive to the needs of others around us as we, as we bear one another's burdens. We pray for Barb Niebuhr, Eric Veenstra, and Rick Lingbeek as they're recovering from recent surgery. Continue to walk with Carol Bonsalar and others as they struggle with pain. Draw near to Nancy Coburn as she draws near to the end of her days. Comfort Bill and Kathy and all the family. Father, we pray for our community, for our youth who struggle with their identity, 
We pray for those who face each day with mental illness. We pray for those who are underemployed. God, we pray for those who see little hope in the face of personal and world problems. We pray for those who feel disconnected from you, from you and from, from your presence. And God, we pray for friends who struggle with health, for job complexities and marriage messes. Give us listening hearts and words of hope for them. We pray for parents who are nearing the end of their strength. We ask that you would reveal to our kids who seem allergic to your grace and love more of yourself each day. We pray for missionaries serving you in, in many different contexts. May the gospel be sweet. May your grace be sufficient. May your hope be fresh each day. And God, we pray for ourselves. You know where we struggle the most and trust you the least. You know our most difficult relationships and our persistent fears. Grant us the mercy and grace we need today for healing, for freedom. We ask all of this, O oh God, so that we may shine your light in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and wherever those who call your name are called to be a light to the nations. God, may this church, and may every church that calls on the name of Jesus, may it go boldly, may it go courageously into the days ahead. For you, O oh God, have promised to never leave us, to never forsake those whom you've called to yourself. So may your love dwell richly among us as we go into our week encouraging one another in the call to, to follow Jesus. We pray this in the name of Christ, who is our Savior and our King. Amen. A couple of announcements uh, here this morning. You should have received via our email from our secretary, Lisa, that uh, the Heritage Happenings is sent out on Thursday. A lot of ministry items in here. want to make you mindful again. We have a new members class planned for the last Sunday of February. Please let me know if you're able and interested to participate in that. We're just going to meet for about an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes after the service in one of our rooms in our education wing. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about what it means to be a member and participate uh, more fully in the life of Heritage Church, uh, let me know about that. Uh, last Sunday, I let you know that uh, we're once again uh, restarting our ministry of adopting, uh, adopting a cow, adopting Daisy uh, through glo uh, Growing Hope Globally. Uh, I know some of you have signed up already. You can adopt Daisy for a week. Uh, trust me, it's a sweet deal. You do not need to pick up after Daisy. You do not even have to physically feed Daisy. You might be concerned about Daisy because it's so cold out these days, but I, sh I can assure you she is well taken care of. But we get to adopt her for a week, and that's all part of this great ministry of helping to support the end of uh, uh, reducing world hunger uh, in the world today, and it combines with a couple other churches. And You'll find out more in our Heritage Happenings about that as well. Our offering this morning continues the ministry of this congregation in its kingdom work and call to proclaim Jesus Christ. And then also we partner this morning with our kingdom initiative of Christian Schools International. And that is a, a worldwide ministry that is helping to equip uh, staff and teachers and students in hearing about Jesus and connecting that faith with their lived out faith in the world today. So that will be our, our loose change offering, uh, which will be collected at the doors on your way out. Finally, just a reminder, we are celebrating communion this morning, and hopefully on the way in, you picked up one of your little packets. Oh, I forgot mine here this morning, but I have mine on the table. But uh, be sure to pick one up, uh, maybe after the message, or one of our elders will be available and get that to you, okay? Well, it's our privilege to turn now to God's Word, and it is a great privilege for us to do that. I invite you to open a Bible with me to the book of Romans. We have been in Romans all the way back in the first Sunday of September, committing ourselves to making our way through the entire book. And I must say, as, uh, as somebody who was, was rather a little intimidated by the book of Romans, I mean, it's a heavy, it's deep, it's beautiful, but it's also, oh, it's immensely pastoral and immensely practical. And I'm very excited that we're continuing our series in Romans. And this morning, we're going to pick up with Romans 11. The last two Sundays, I've mentioned this, but Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a significant sort of attention that Paul gives in his book. 
For the first eight chapters, he's proclaimed the gospel again. He's reminded us that we are in Christ. Then he raises a very pastoral and personal question. What about those who are not in Christ? In particular, he is referring to his own family. What about the Israelites, those who supposedly, and certainly by grace, walked with God for centuries? What about them? And what about them in that day that Paul, his heart's concerned about them? In fact, uh, you, you got to love the language Paul uses in Romans 9. He says there that my heart, I, says, I, have, I have great sorrow and, and unceasing anguish in my heart for those who need to know Jesus. So there's that mission call already as we're going through the book here. This is that imperative for us to, to proclaim Christ. Paul's heart is burdened. He longs to see uh, the people of Israel in particular, but uh, he's a missionary of missionaries, right? He goes out all over the place planting churches, and, but his heart is for his family. His heart is for his relatives. His heart is for the nation of Israel. The good news is that some did come to Christ, and we have an account for that. In the book of Acts, Luke, who's writing the book of Acts to talk about faith, reminds us that at Pentecost there were God-fearing Jews from all over the place, from every nation under heaven, in fact, he says. They were gathered in Jerusalem, and it tells us that on the day of Pentecost, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaims the gospel. And we have this, this wonderful verse in Acts 2, verse 41. And uh, Luke says, here's what happened. He says, those who accepted Peter's message that day were baptized, and 3,000 were added to that day. 3,000. Now, 3,000, I think it's safe to presume, 3,000 of God-fearing Jews, Israelites. And this morning, as we look at uh, Romans 11, we're going to hear, I hope in profound ways, what we need to hear, and that is what we've heard this morning already, and that is that God's mercy is new every morning. That his, as the psalmist says, his faithfulness reaches to the skies. We're going to look at the first 10 verses of Romans 11, and then we'll look at the second part next week. This morning is all about this, what does it mean that God's love is steadfast? And then when we look at the rest of Romans 11 next week, reminded why God's promises never fail. So that's what we'll do this morning. What, is it, what does it mean that God's love or God's mercy his chesed, as the Hebrew word is, uh, is steadfast. But before we look at God's word, join me in prayer once again. We come, O oh God, with open hands. Your word is here in our hands. Pray that it would be written on our hearts. That we would be overwhelmed even, Lord Jesus, by the, the steadfast love of the Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Breathe this wonderful good news into us that we might have the burden that Paul has for those who need to hear about Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. First 10 verses of Romans chapter 11. The title in the NIV is a very important title. Paul talks about the remnant of Israel. The remnant of Israel. Listen to God's Word this morning. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left. And they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. And others were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And David says, 
May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Hard words from God, his gospel to us this morning. This is God's word for us. You may be seated once again. I feel like in my ministry as a pastor and a preacher, I often have referred to this verse, but it's a good one to be reminded of this morning. Hebrews 11 is the great chapter in which you hear what we call the hall of faith, and it begins with those wonderful words. It tells us faith, faith is being sure of what we hope for and confident of what we do not yet see. Sure and confident. A few Sundays ago, we talked about how certainty is not the enemy of faith. There are many things we can be certain of. But that reality that the writer of Hebrews pulls out and then paints this portrait of the church says, look, here is faith lived out. Faith is being sure. And one of the things we are sure of, though like you, uh, when life goes on in a week, it's not the sort of thing that uh, always pops up into our memory, but one of the things that faith is sure of is the fact that God keeps His promise. I know, it doesn't sound like so earth-shattering in some sense for those who follow the news on a daily basis and we're constantly being fed by all this media and information. We kind of, though, that, that, that feel like that's kind of a has-been statement. But everything that Paul talks about here in Romans 11, in particular verses 1 through 10, is that very key principle, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. God keeps. God keeps His promises. So here's a quick overview before we get to our passage this morning. And that is to remind ourselves that all the way back in Genesis 3, verse 15, we get the proto-gospel or the first hint of the gospel when God reminds us of a promise made then. It's a promise made to Eve, and it's a promise against the serpent. Here we find that God says to the serpent there's going to be en enmity, which is an interesting word we don't use very often, but there's going to be, in essence, this huge conflict between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. And in Genesis 3, verse 15, we find there that God says, look, uh, the serpent is going to have the head crushed by the offspring, the offspring of, of Eve, the first promise of the gospel. Quick flash forward, Genesis 15, God calls Abraham out from among the nations, makes a covenant with him, and that word is very important. God makes a covenant with Abraham. He says, look, Abraham, here's the deal. I'm going to be your God, and you and all of your descendants, which you will not be able to number, they are going to be my people. Now, in that covenant relationship, God says, now there's an obligation. You need to now walk with me, too. You need to Walk by faith with me. And as the biblical story unfolds, we find that, well, even though God's love is steadfast, the love of God's people is not so. We read these verses in Psalm 103, right? The Lord is compassionate and gracious, abounding in love. And that abounding in love is that wonderful, beautiful word in the Bible, chesed. Or if you can't kind of make that, <laughs> no, it's just, just do the H, has said, that's fine. But if you can do the, <laughs> you get extra points, by the way. God's has said, his, his, his faithfulness, his steadfast love. And, and so we see in the history of God's people from, from Adam and Eve and the fall and the sin now to Abraham. And, and now I just want to fast forward 1,500 years later. And God's people are in exile because according to the, the prophet Ezra, According to Ezra, God's people have done evil deeds and great guilt, and so they're in captivity to Babylon. But even then, and I, I'm really streaming faster history, but it's good for us to hear this again. This is a redemptive story. Even then, God says, I make this promise. There will be a remnant. There will be a coming back to me. And this is all part of that picture of the chesed, the, the, the steadfast love of God, the covenant keeping, the promise keeping, the promise making, promise keeping, promise fulfilling reality of God's grace. I raise all of this background in part because Paul is talking to a church in Rome. We know 
And this is not something we boast about. This is just the knowledge we have. We know that, as we heard two Sundays ago, not everybody of Israel is of Israel. Not every descendant of Abraham is a child of Abraham. In other words, there were some for whom God's promise was not effective. They turned or they spurned God, and that's the latter part of the verses we read this morning. Their hearts were hardened. That fact is likely the cause of some presumed distress amongst the church in Rome. You see, among the church in Rome, you have to imagine, yes, there were Gentile believers, former slaves even, but there were also Jewish believers by nationality. They had come to Christ, and they know the story. It's like knowing the story of your family, going back, if you're fortunate, maybe two generations, three generations, maybe even four. And, and part of that story is knowing the faith of those who've gone before you. And the Jewish believers in Christ, they know the story and they know that not all were faithful. And the question that Paul seems to address, and it's very pastoral for us today, is, is God a promise keeper? Will God abandon his people? And Paul answers it in two ways. And let's look at each of them from our passage this morning. First, Paul says, okay, the question is there. If not everybody who was of Israel was of Israel, if not every descendant of Abraham was a child of God, might God not keep his promise with us? And Paul answers there emphatically, by no means. He says, case study number one, look at me. Look at me, says Paul. Who am I? Well, I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Judah, which in shorthand is basically Paul saying, in effect, hey, I am a Jew of Jews. It's hard to imagine a stronger resume uh, in regard to what it means to be an Israelite. Paul is saying, look, I am, I am living proof that God does not, nor did he, reject his people. Now, let's just look a little bit at Paul's story. Paul, who was formerly Saul. Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus. Paul, who was public enemy number one of the church. Paul, who refers to himself in 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, as the worst of sinners. And he's not using hyperbole here. One person says of this, people like Paul are living demonstrations that God is not through with the Jew. In particular, those like Paul who come to faith in Christ. So Paul stands up here and first says, okay, for those of you who are in the church and, and you feel like you're, a, a, we're going to talk about this soon, uh, next Sunday, a, a branch that has been grafted in, and you're wondering if the graft is going to stick, God says, Paul says, look at, look at me, he says. I'm in, I'm loved, I know the covenant, I know the God behind it. God keeps his promises. That's his first case study. The second one, he goes back to the Old Testament to a remarkable moment in the ministry of Elijah. Elijah, who's a prophet, probably his most well-known moment is when he's at Mount Carmel and, uh, and all the priests of Baal are there and they're mocking him and he comes up with this little scenario. He says, all right, you worship your God, I'll worship mine, and let's see which one responds. And maybe you're familiar with the story, 1 Kings 18. Uh, the prophets of Baal are, are just going into a frenzy to try to get their Baal god to respond. Of course, he doesn't. And then Elijah builds his altar and douses it with water, prays a prayer, and the fire of heaven comes down and consumes everything. In other words, God wins that day. But then Jezebel, who is the wife of Ahab, uh, says, that's it, Elijah, you're done. You're done, I'm coming after you, and I'm going to kill you. And he runs, and he runs out, and he, apparently he runs really far, really fast, ends up in the desert, and then his plaint, right, his complaint of his heart is, hey, God, I'm all that's left. It's just me, and I can't do it. And God says to him, hold on a minute, Elijah. This is getting back to the covenant reality that we're talking about here in Paul. God says, time out to Elijah. Whoa, you can't see everything. There are 7,000 others who have not bent their knee to Baal. What does God's chesed 
What does God's steadfast mercy, what does God, the promise keeper, promise maker, promise keeper, promise fulfiller, what does he say to us when we wonder, can God keep his promise? Number, the second part is, hey, hey, you're not alone in this world. I think it's one of the great struggles for those who are living in countries where Christianity is not the favored religion by far, and they may wonder, is it just me? Is it just me? I think to some degree, even here in our North American context, where we can get very comfortable with faith, we may even wonder, hey, it's just me. And God pulls back the camera and says, whoa, whoa, hold on a minute. Let me encourage you. Let me remind you, God says. Now, I'll be honest, I'm one who finds myself lamenting more than I probably should, lamenting some of the state of the church in North America today. It feels like we're losing a lot of ground or we've just given up too much territory. Part of the theme of the letter to the church and the believers in Rome was Paul saying, you may be small, but you must be resilient. But it's hard to be resilient when there's so much pressure to conform, so much pressure to, to give up and to just be relevant versus resilient. And yet, here's Paul saying to the believers in Rome, saying through the Holy Spirit to the church throughout history, you are not alone. You can't see everything. You can't. God is a God who keeps promises. And what encouragement for me as I, I think about this, as I'm reminded as I have been in these last few years, um, we, we tend to get a little myopic when we think about the church. We just think about the church maybe here in, in Kalamazoo or in Michigan or, or North America. But the global church today is growing. It's growing in Africa. It's growing in South America. It's growing in the Middle East. It's growing in the East. I mean, the church is not dead. Paul, Paul catches on to that, and this is God says to us this morning, you are not alone. God keeps his promises. There is always going to be a remnant, and that's what God says to Elijah, and that's what he says to us this morning, faithful followers globally. Encourage us to be faithful, to, to hold on to God's promise. And that's where Paul leads us next in verses 5 to 6. He says there uh, in these beautiful words, which is the picture of, of what we're looking at because this is all about grace, right? Paul says, so too at the present time, just as there is still today, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Now, remnant language, that's God's people language. That's Jewish believers in the church in Rome saying, oh, you mean there's more than just us who come from a long lineage of Israelites following God, right? And so Paul goes on to say, uh, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, and it's no longer works, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. And hey, we've heard that throughout Romans 1 through 8. It's understandable then when when from our limited human perspective, the church can feel so infinitesimally small. And you might wonder, when you think about the odds, is it worth being resilient? Which we've heard about throughout the series, right? Is it worth being resilient? And here's what Paul draws us to this morning and draws the church then to. People of God, just know this. God is a promise keeper. His chesed, his steadfast love, endures forever. His faithfulness reaches to the skies. And at the root of holding on to that as a remnant, as the called out ones, is this beautiful picture of grace. If you and I are ever struggling with wondering, is it worth it? Or am I alone? Or I feel so small? Or is the church going to make it? And in the last 10 years, I have heard this often in particular when people have lamented, and rightly so, how many young people are leaving the church, and they'll say, I don't know if the church is going to make it, and I get it. We ought to hear that and respond as a church, but never give up hope. Never. God is a promise-keeping God. And to Jewish believers in the church in Rome that day, he just assures them with that. God does not reject those whom he foreknew. He will never do that. Just as God sovereignly keeps His own, and He's always done that, we can confidently be resilient today. We can be. We ought to be. 
We must be. You know, if you've sat here any length of time when I preach, I often like to reference hymns. And as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think of that wonderful hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We sing in, in the, one of those verses, we say, Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. I love those words. We will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. That's, that's the language what Paul's saying here in Romans 11. The chesed of God, His steadfast love. Oh, man, you can, you can take that to the bank. God's elect, Paul says here, they obtain, they receive what God has promised because God will not forsake those who call on Him, which gets to the latter part of our passage this morning, uh, which is some hard language, as I said, and that is the fact that there are some who harden their hearts. It's a bit of a mystery how this comes into effect, I must admit to you, but the sense in which God those who reject God's promise, God says, uh, he, I give them over. I, I let them be. I let their hearts get hardened. Essentially, God gives them over. And, and if you want to know what we ought to do about that, get back to Romans 9. And Paul says, we have to burn with desire for them to come to Christ. Why does Paul share all of that here? The whole part of it. Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's likely that uh, within the church in Rome, there were Christ followers who were descendants of Abraham, right? So now we know some of their lineage. And maybe, maybe I think it's safe to say, maybe they are wondering, will God be faithful to Israel? In other words, to those who have a history. And the firm answer to that question is important because in practical ways, we get to find out, we get to know whether or not God will be faithful to us. How can we be sure? Because we want that. Faith is sure of what we hope for. How can we be sure that God is going to keep His promise to the church? And I mean the big C church. I say that because a study came out this past few months from the Barna organization, which assesses churches. And, of course, they make predictions, and I'm always a little hesitant to embrace predictions because it's like looking into a crystal ball sometimes. But the Barna organization said they predict that one in five churches in, in North America, that's who they study, one in five churches is going to close in the next six to eight months, partly due to the reality of a pandemic world and everything else involved with it. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I know it does things in my heart some of which are not holy. But in the midst of it is the question Paul's asking for you as a church, for me as a pastor, for us together, for the big C church of our world, will God be faithful? And the words of Jesus come to mind, the gates of hell will never prevail. Look at those who need to know that God is true. How do we cling to the chesed of God? Well, the answer lies not in us, but where Paul places it this morning, he says it's all in God's grace. That's what we cling to. The very thing we talked about from the very beginning. We know that we're saved by grace, and now we're hearing again that we're, we're kept by God's grace, and, and by God's grace, he says, there will always be a remnant. So we take God at His word, and we seek to be faithful. I love the passage uh, in Revelation 7, verse 9. This, for many, rightly so, is used as a, a great encouragement and really, in a sense, a, a kick in the pants for, for getting into the church and trusting in God's faithfulness. But here's this beautiful picture. John, the apostle, is caught up in the glory into the picture of what uh, Jesus gives him for the church, and he says, here's the church. And I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. And we say great multitude, yeah, it sounds, no, I mean, great, really great. It's huge. It's large. It's expansive. In fact, no one can count it. And that should hint us. That's the promise God made to Abraham. You will not be able to count the stars of the sands, uh, uh, the, uh, st uh, sand on the seashore, right? It, you can't count it. From every nation, tribe, people, language, and they're all standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. And 
I want us to hang on to that because we can get discouraged. The church in Rome probably got a little discouraged being so small in the midst of a great mighty Rome. But here's the church. And God is faithful. And God will, here's this vision of the church. He will, he will take hold of faithful people and call them to himself and he'll keep his promise. We're going to sing at the end of our service a beautiful hymn which is based on these next words from 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. I think these can be and they should be a great source of encouragement to us. I know we're trying to manage, if we can, a pandemic and economic realities and political concerns and, and God is not um, unfavorable in wanting us to be concerned about those things, but this is for the church. In the sphere of the church that we are in, being faithful to God, here's what he says to us through Paul here in 1 Timothy. Paul says, I am not ashamed. There's language of Romans again, right? Romans 1, 16 and 17. Here he says in 1 Timothy, I am not ashamed because I know. That's language of Hebrews 11. I'm sure, I'm confident, I know, I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced, or some of the language says, I am persuaded. I'm persuaded, I'm convinced that he is able to guard or to keep what I have entrusted to him for that day. Paul here in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is speaking to the church, having heard the gospel, now hear who we are, and why can we be resilient? Oh, it's because he keeps his promises. He keeps them to the very end. To those who trust in Christ, who shows us God's faithfulness, right? In a few moments, we're going to gather at the table, and you want to be sure of God's promise? Come eat, come drink, come and believe. Believe it and proclaim the good news of God's love in Christ. Call on His name and you will be saved. And once you understand what that means, saved by grace alone, let's walk by grace. Let's trust in God's promises because His promises will never end. His chesed, his, his steadfast mercy, His compassion for faithful men and women who take hold of God's love. It will never end. So let's be faithful. Let's be faithful in proclaiming the good news. Let's be faithful in, in pursuing uh, God's will when it comes to our, our relationships and our finances and our, and our very body. Let's, let's embrace and be faithful to God's will. I know there's a lot of pressure, but let's not conform to the patterns of this world, which is the next section in Romans 12. Let's be faithful in pursuing God's will, faithful in, in every relationship, faithful in, in how we love our neighbor and seek the common good. Yeah, we can be pretty small in the world, but God is not a God who forsakes. Let's be faithful in pursuing reconciliation, faithful in being generous, faithful in trusting in God's providence. Let's be faithful to Christ's church. Let's be faithful in honoring those in authority over us. Let's be faithful in, in and I love this, I'm going to quote him again, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that we do. Why? Because of God's chesed, because of his steadfast love. He's a promise maker and a promise keeper. So let's be faithful. Because God's grace quote another hymn, God's grace has brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. In that sure, in that certain promise, may our hearts be glad. May we not be afraid. May our eyes and our ears not be hardened, but open to the gracious goodness of God that we might tell the story. For as we will remember together here at, at the table in just a moment, God is faithful. And He will do it because He will never forsake those who trust in Him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray that that good news would so saturate my heart and our hearts today that Though we might feel so, so small, so lacking of influence and power in our world, uh, the fact is 
Our hope is in the God who is sovereign over all. So we'll be faithful in the small things. Faithful in those things you've called us to uh, be a light into our neighborhood and, and at work and, and school and all these places because you are sure in your chesed, in your steadfast love. You will always keep. So may we keep to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the Holy Supper we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, a feast of communion, and a feast of hope. We come to remember. We remember that Jesus was sent by the Father to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to God's law, even to the bitter suffering and death of the cross. And through his death and resurrection and ascension, Jesus establishes a new and eternal covenant of grace that we might be accepted and never forsaken. So we come to remember this morning. We also come to have communion, communion with Christ, Christ who promised to be with us always to the very end of this world. And in the bread, Jesus makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us for eternal life. And in the cup, he comes to us as the vine in whom we are to abide that we might bear fruit. We come to have remembrance, to come to have communion, and we come in hope. Believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge, they are a foretaste of the feast that we shall partake in when Christ's kingdom has fully come and and we shall see him and be made like him in glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body, so we are to receive this meal in true love, mindful of the communion and the hope. So now following Jesus' example, we take this bread and we take this cup, ordinary things that God uses for extraordinary purposes. And as we come to the table, I invite you to join me in prayer once again. Let's pray together. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways, you have revealed yourself in ages past to be true. You have blessed us today with these signs of grace. We praise you that, that through the waters of the sea, you led your people out of bondage into freedom. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who was for us baptized in the waters of the Jordan and anointed as Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death, and you have cleansed us. We are born again. We pray you will send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us today the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Renew us, that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom belongs all glory and all honor. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust him alone for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to Christ as Lord, are now invited to come with gladness to the table of our Lord. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it and said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to tear back the first level on those cups. And let's do this liturgy together. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, thanks be to God. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Please feel free to tear back that next layer on your little cups. And then join me in this liturgy. The blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer once again. God of grace, you have renewed us here at your table with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. These are sure promises. And you, O oh God, are faithful. Your chesed, your steadfast love endures forever. We pray that having been here together that our faith has been strengthened again, but you will also strengthen us in love. Help us to live and work to the glory and praise of your name for the sake of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for God's blessing this morning. We read in Lamentations 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. As those who come and those who know that God's steadfast love is better than life, may our lips glorify him. May our souls be satisfied in him and in the sure and certain hope of Christ, receive God's blessings as you go from this place. May the God of peace himself give you peace. At all times, in every way, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And together, God's people say, Amen.